All right, I think we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our new series. I wanted to uh, introduce you to Megan Key, who's the founder of 2020 Arts, and uh, she's going to be uh, hosting this series on mental health and creativity over the, the month of July. So tune in every Friday at 5 p.m. She will be here. Um, before the series gets started next week with uh, Megan introducing us to an artist, uh, we thought it would be helpful and informative to learn a bit more about Megan and about her wonderful organization. I've watched kind of from social media and, you know, have been really impressed with the work that you do and really, really interested to learn more about it today, to learn more about the inspiration behind starting 2020 Arts um, and really just learn more about you and, and your story as well. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you and I will just say to the audience, if you do have questions, please feel free to drop them in the comment section and we will get to them at some point uh, during the discussion today. Awesome. So yeah. tell us a little bit about you, Megan. Um, what, uh, yeah, tell us about yourself and then about a bit about your organization. Okay, so I'll try to keep it a little bit condensed, um, but I, I've been working in the fine art industry for the past 10 years. And so art has always been a passion of mine. And I started getting into art as a practitioner and a creator. I realized it was the first thing I really did that I got good at. And I realized that I, if I put in the time and the effort that I could really like have this amazing skill set. So I started as a practitioner. I wanted to be a practicing artist. I wanted to be a tattoo artist. Um, and as I slowly progressed throughout my education, I realized that I love the theory. I love the academia. I loved what art was to people and the meaning behind art. And so I started getting into criticism and curatorial practice, started getting into curating and like museum and gallery shows. And I sort of like picked up little pieces of all different types of experience from exhibitions to project management to social media marketing to shipping and logistics and all of these very strange and disparate skills. And I kind of felt a little bit directionless in that sense. I knew that I kind of wanted to be a curator. I wanted to be creative in whatever I did, even if I wasn't a practicing artist. And I kind of felt a little lost because I had all these little pieces and all these skills all over the place. And then it all kind of came together at some point when I realized that all of those skills lent themselves to being an entrepreneur and that actually having so many different skills was going to be beneficial to my career as an entrepreneur. So I actually had no idea that I wanted to start an organization, let alone a nonprofit organization. Probably. Where were you? Sorry, I'm just going to ask. Where were you um, working before? Like, what were you doing specifically before you kind of pivoted into that direction? So I was working at an art advisory firm for a little bit, and I didn't feel so. I was working at art advisory firm, and at that time. I had found out that my brother had passed away and that was sort of like a very big change and shift in my life. And mm -hmm. I realized in my grief and loss that I was very unhappy with where I was. And so I realized I had to transition out of that. And so I started working at an art gallery. So I was doing sales and shipping and installation and all these different types of things. And I realized that that didn't really fulfill me either. It didn't really spark any sort of passion or drive. Um, and in the transition between those two jobs, I started out of nowhere, it kind of came that I just had this inspiration that I wanted to raise awareness for mental health. And so I came up with this idea that we could have a gallery exhibition that had artworks about mental health and the sale of them, a portion of those sales would be donated to a mental health organization. So it all kind of started with that idea. Mm -hmm. So I approached Northern Contemporary we're still a gallery in the city um, with the show idea. And they said, great, let's do it. Um, and they let me use their space for free, which was just amazing. Like everything sort of fell into place and it was really fantastic in that way. And once I finished that show and it was successful and we worked with the Toronto Distress Center. So that's where the money was donated to. I realized every time that I went to work and I would come home that the only thing I wanted to do was to come home and work on this project. Mm -hmm. So through doing that, I realized like this is really where my passion is, that I have a real drive and motivation to do something 
where I get to be creative and then I also get to give back and talk about something that's really important to me. Um, so I started doing these projects and then after doing that show, I, uh, I, I sat on the subway every single day, like most people do to get to work. And sitting on the subway, you stare at the same posters, same mattress advertisements over and over again. And you spend so much time looking. And I thought this would be an amazing place to put art. And obviously there's Sketch the Line, which is already on mm -hmm. the TV. But I thought, wouldn't it be great if we had art that made people think? Especially in this, everybody does the same trip every single day. It would be so amazing if while somebody was looking that they got to think about something really meaningful that really connected with their values in a way that maybe mattresses don't, you know? <laughs> so I, I thought it would be great if art was on here. I would love to take the mental health art exhibition and transition that into life. Like it ended up being life on the line. Um, mm -hmm. but also the TTC. And so I kind of just started putting that together. Um, I got in touch with CMHA, the Canadian Mental Health Association of Toronto, and started working with their fundraising coordinator, who is fantastic. And we built the whole project together. And it ended up being like this really fantastic first big project, first public art project that I'd ever done. Um, and basically when it launched in November 2018, 20. 2018, I think, as mm -hmm. when I quit my full-time job officially, and I took the dive into freelance and working on 2020 arts. And I only yeah. really incorporated 2020 arts about six months before that project because I recognized that asking for money uh, for sponsorship for the project just from Megan Key probably didn't have as much credibility. So I decided mm -hmm. to incorporate a nonprofit. It's going to be Megan at 2020 Arts. I'm going to have a website. It's going to look really official. Um, and so that's really the only reason that I incorporated a nonprofit. It was something that a year before I knew I want to do at some point in my life, but I never anticipated doing it as quickly as I did. It just sort of happened. Yeah. And I'm yeah. very happy that it happened the way that it yeah. did. So. Yeah. It's so nice to like hear stories like that where, you know, there's this, similar to me, you know, I fell into mental health advocacy after several years of trying to figure out what do I actually want to do? And, and, and you just know when you fall into it, then that you could be doing it at all hours and you just have that drive and that passion. And it's like a passion project really. And it's, uh, yeah, we're lucky to be able to do that. Um, and then, you know, obviously the art side of things makes sense. Like that was your background. And were you like from a young child, was art something that you kind of turned to or did, was art more of a later on in life? I think it's kind of present like throughout. I remember um, mm -hmm. those like tiny little water, hard watercolors, you know, with those like really stiff bristle brushes and the I used to paint these, uh, what do you call it, like coloring books. I paint inside the lines. That, but it wasn't probably until I was in elementary school that I had somebody show me how to shade colors, which sounds so ridiculous. You know, you used to do those big Bristol board presentations. You used to have yeah. the big bubble letters across the top. And he taught me how to shade and to do gradation with color. And it was just that thing I realized, oh, my God. It doesn't, I can do this. This is something I can do. So I just started doodling. I started being that person who would like draw all over my arms in middle class and wouldn't pay attention. And I would be doodling in, in the sides of my notebooks. Um, and so it like slowly took over me. Very yeah. Slowly, so. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have an art background at all. So, you know, we're coming from two, two different worlds. Um, and then the mental health side. So. Um, you know, you mentioned your brother had passed away and uh, also in knowing a little bit about you, I understand that you also uh, suffer with bipolar disorder or have in the past. I'm not sure where you are at now, but I imagine that that also was part of the inspiration behind like the mental health pairing it with um, the art side of things. So can you take us a little bit through your own personal story at Made of Millions, we do find that there's a lot of power in storytelling. And I think especially with people like you that are out there and advocates and kind of you have a, fa a public, very much a public facing um, career that it's it's nice to learn a bit more about where you've where you've been and where you've come from and, and that you're turning something that I imagine was very difficult and challenging and potentially still difficult and challenging and putting it into something positive. Yeah, definitely. I think as, as I'm sure 
it is for everybody, as I'm sure it is for you. It's a, it's a progression over time. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's strange because looking back in retrospect, I have a clear picture of how my mental health journey started that I did at the time. At the time, I was completely oblivious. Yeah. Um, I didn't learn about mental health in school, and I hope that that's changing now. But even in elementary and high school, it was never once mentioned. I never heard about depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar. These were never words that were a part of my vocabulary. And it's funny, I have a memory now looking back retrospectively that the last time I remember being so joyful as a child was when I was like 12 years old. I was like, I was on top of the world. I, life was great. And then at about 13, early preteen years, I started just having, having things happen to me that I just thought were normal because you have no context to really explain it. So I'd start playing out of nowhere. I like, I would be like inconsolable for hours at a time, but I just assumed that that was just a part normal what people went through yeah definitely and so i had nothing to contextualize it so i just thought you know this is normal this is me and then as i got a little bit older i started to feel like there were personality flaws and so that that made it a little bit more difficult in a sense because it felt like oh this is my fault that i'm feeling this way as opposed to this thing is happening to me um and that's why I think mental health education is so important from like a very young age because it helps people understand that there's more to the situation than just there's something wrong with me. Yeah, um, so it alleviates like the guilt or the I'm a bad person or I'm weak or, you know, all of that stuff. If you actually have an understanding of what's happening in your brain as a medical issue. Yeah, absolutely. And it also makes you feel when you when you read up about it or maybe connect with other people who have the same experience that you're not alone. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you feel a little bit, you know, you feel isolated. You feel, you feel crazy. You feel like your reality isn't uh, isn't aligned with other people's sense of reality. Yeah. So, um, I would say, yeah, there was a lot of emotional volatility in my teens that I just sort of chalked up to being a teenager because. You know, yeah. so sure. probably other people were saying to you as well, right? Yeah. Like yeah. this is normal. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, and it wasn't until I went to university where I started sort of noticing some very, that's what I'm looking for, exaggerated emotions to the point where I would be at work. And then all of a sudden I would have a panic attack while I was like a cashier at Indigo. And I would have to try to explain that I, I wasn't sick, but I had to go home because I could not be here right now. And that was a very difficult thing to explain when I didn't really know how to explain it or what I was explaining. Yeah. Um, and then I also had experiences of deep depression. Um, when I first started, I went to OCAD. So when I first started university, I would say in the first two years, I dealt with deep depression and I also had bouts of mania where I would literally stay awake for like three days at a time. And I was like on top of the world, like felt completely unstoppable. And and you still didn't know what was going on at that point? No idea, really no yeah. idea. And when you were depressed, you just thought, I'm just sad. Like I'm just going through something, it's okay, you know? Yeah, and as, as a woman as well, I think, you know, that time of the month, I'd be like, oh, well, my, my period is coming in a week. Therefore, this is why this is happening. And then after a while, I would be like, I'm so depressed right now. But my period was two weeks ago. So it stopped making sense because I tried yeah. to make sense of it in every logical way that I could. But once it stopped making sense, that's when I realized, OK, something else is going on here. Mm -hmm. um, and then I actually met somebody who said to me, you know, I, I think I'm bipolar. And that was like the alleviation of meeting somebody who said that to me was like, you know, like heaven's gates opened up. I just felt like, oh my God, there's somebody else that I can talk to about what I'm experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, but I never really explored it any further than that at that time. Um, and then it's sort of, so I started, I mean, you know, you turn 19, you start drinking, doing the whole thing, mm -hmm. or like smoking weed and all that kind of stuff. And that desire to party, I guess, uh, and being led into the party life with like drinking and drugs and all that kind of stuff. It, it creates this unbelievable like sense of fog and unease. And like, it's completely unsustainable, obviously, especially if you have mental health issues. 
Um, and so that made it even worse. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that at the time because I would feel momentarily good and then I'd feel crappy and then I would go out and party again and I'd feel good again. So it was a very sort of volatile time. And then I moved to the UK to do my master's for a year and I kept drinking, kept partying, kept doing all that stuff. But that was the first time I would say that I, I finally found purpose in what I was doing. So my master sort of grounded me amidst all of the chaos. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when I got back about seven months after I got back from London, my brother passed away. Um, and I wasn't doing great after I come back. I was sort of still all over the place, hadn't really figured everything out, but I was starting to differentiate a little bit between emotion and logic. So I could have an emotion and I had an understanding that just because I had an emotion didn't mean there was an external reason for that emotion. Right. Because I used to be like, oh, I'm irritable. It must be because you did this. It must be because mm -hmm. this has happened. I tried to like find logic to ground the emotion. Um, but as but I at that point, you still didn't have like a diagnosis or anything. You still hadn't gone for any help. No. You were just kind of making sense of this on your own. Yeah, kind of being all over the place, like relationships all over the place. Everything was kind of it felt like there was something, there was a piece of the puzzle missing that I had not yet figured out. Um, and it, it was difficult because I kind of felt like I didn't really know where to turn. Mm -hmm. um, and then after receiving the news that my brother died, I, it got even worse. <laughs> like obviously it got worse yeah. at that time. And so for about seven months, I like, I ruminated over and over about the week leading up to it, his death, the week after the funeral. And so I basically made myself sick with those thoughts. So when I was at work, I was having panic attacks pretty regularly. Um, and what was it, was ruminating about like, just going over like uh, your last interaction with him and if you could have done anything like, yeah, to prevent or, you know, that type of, yeah. Yeah, I kept thinking about like, definitely those thoughts were going through my mind as well as just reliving the funeral and and now that i look back obviously that was a really not positive thing to do to keep rethinking yeah. that whole experience but something about the i don't know it, it it almost helped me like feel my grief in a way um because the first week after learning that he died i kind of went emotionally numb like i had trouble crying even though i was so broken up inside it almost feels like my emotions protected me for that period of time it made me so numb to absolutely anything um so then I guess, I don't know. I guess a part of me thought that like ruminating over and over, I'd find clarity in those moments. Yeah, of course. It's like a form yeah. of control or like maybe if I if I come to a con conclusion that I'm comfortable with, then maybe I'll feel better. Yeah. Like you're probably looking for a bit of relief. Definitely. Somehow. Yeah. But and obviously ruminating just makes everything worse. Much, much worse. But the brain wants to wants to do that. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and so I started, I mean, it was about seven months, I would say, after we passed, where it was just absolute chaos in my mind. Um, and then I'm not really sure what changed, but I have like this distinct memory. He died in May of 2016. And New Year's was literally like the start of an entirely new person. Like I started to, to recognize that I'd spent the past seven months thinking about the last two weeks of his life, but I spent almost no time thinking about the other 27 years of his life. And it was sort of like this light bulb went off, like, right, like that's what I should be focusing on because I can't change the events of what had happened. And right. I need to be more focused on the positive side of things. Um, and did you like, were you seeing a therapist at that point? Like when did you actually receive your diagnosis? So, I mean, technically I've never been like formally diagnosed. I've gone to seek therapy, um, affordable mm -hmm. therapy um, with the, I forget what it's called, I think it's called Ontario Life Sciences. And okay. so they have uh, an affordable therapy practice It's pay what you can. Um, and that's fantastic. Um, but it just didn't end up working out with the therapist that I was with, the place that it was in. And every time it just didn't really work out. Um, and I started feeling that was about three months after the New Year's where I started getting a little bit of clarity for myself. Yeah, I just think that's amazing that you were able to get that clarity on your own, you know, like 
a lot of it, I mean, this is something like I, I speak about on my own channels a lot, but for me, like there's a couple of factors that yeah. led to that. And one of them was eating healthy. Um, the second was exercise. And the most important that I'm sure everybody I know around me is so sick of hearing about this, but is meditation. Meditation yeah. is the single most impactful thing that I've done and continue to do for my mental health um, because it allowed me to really separate. And it made me realize in the moment as I was walking down the street, all of a sudden I would be present and realize I'm thinking about the funeral again. I'm thinking about, and it's making me feel this way. So I was, I became present in my own mind. And that was like a process. Like I've meditated for years, um, but I really started leaning into that. Every time I felt really depressed, I would force myself which is, might not be the healthiest thing, but to sit down and just meditate and sit with my thoughts and just try to do some breathing practices. And like, I, I mean, Don't you find, I just had a question about that because I, I also, you know, I suffer with obsessive compulsive disorder and I find when it's really bad, you know, when I'm having a period of time where my symptoms are quite um, strong, that it is really challenging to sit in a meditation because um, it's just too much and, and I can't get that separation because it almost uh, gives me an opportunity to think more about the obsession. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I, you know, it has to be when it's not so bad. And then basically what I believe meditation does for me is it then prevents those really bad times. But there are like periods where I've had a relapse and I'm like, I just can't meditate and like you can't I couldn't get that separation yeah I I mean I completely agree with that there are times when I I mean I still experience depressive bouts like pretty bad ones sometimes but and in those moments I'm the same as you like I can't sit down and meditate mm -hmm. um it's in many ways more of a preventative measure like when I am yeah. feeling good I'm feeling okay that's I'm like okay I'm going to do the hard work now because it's going to help me yeah. just stay in this this feeling um, because yeah, sometimes it is really, and especially like for me when I'm depressed, um, I don't know if it's like the same with OCD, but I, it's like the head fog in some way. Like mm -hmm. I, I really, like have trouble concentrating on work. Um, I have trouble concentrating on conversations. And so there's no concentration happening. So the idea of focusing my mind on my breathing is near. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And then I, I would like to talk a little bit more about your brother. And I know I'm sure that is obviously really challenging, but, you know, partly because I know he passed away. Um, I think it was an overdose. And I know that this is something that, you know, is becoming increasingly, um, you, we're seeing it more and more, the numbers are increasing. And I think especially during COVID, like there's been a lot um, not only in Canada, but also in the US and, and abroad. Um, and I know that you've, uh, you're have you doing a project specifically to raise awareness around that. Um, so yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your brother and, and, and um, what happened there and then coming to, to now and what you're doing in that space? Yeah, definitely. So brother's name was Jason um, and he was like an absolutely fantastic a lovable warm human being he was the kind of person where you know you meet somebody and like immediately you just feel like at ease and comfortable. Mm -hmm. they just per they just want to make you feel at ease and comfortable he was very much that person he was very ambitious and motivated he loved music um, but throughout I would say probably his, his later teens into his 20s he suffered from addiction and mm -hmm looking back now and those conversations I wish I had had, I feel like he did deal with depression, um, but it was never fully recognized because it was always under this cloud of the coping me mechanisms. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, it's difficult to speak to like his addiction necessarily, but yeah. it was, it sort of escalated and that kind of got better and, and, and being somebody supporting somebody who's dealing with addiction is a very difficult thing to do because you there's no solution that you can provide and you want to like help somebody so much but there's only so much that you can really do for yeah. somebody and I think there's a recognition for everybody who might be dealing with 
a family member or a loved one who suffers from addiction and just sort of accepting that you just have to be there in whatever capacity that person needs in. Um, so when I so when I got back about a week before he passed away, his girlfriend passed away also from an overdose. Wow. Um, and so that whole week was a part of what kept me playing in my mind. And it was, I mean, I can't. Sorry, that was before or after? So this, so she died a week before he died. Right. Um, and he was there and I, like, I, I can't even imagine like what, what he had gone through and that whole experience. Um, and then I think as a result of that, he leaned more heavily into his drug use to try and not have to feel the pain yeah. of that loss. Um, and then it was the May 2-4 weekend. Um, I was at High Park and I remember receiving the call and it was almost, I mean, like a dream almost. Like it didn't, it didn't really feel real for a very long time. Um, and yeah, that, that impacted me, obviously. It changed the entire course of my life moving forward. And for his funeral, one thing that we asked was that people could make donations to CAMH, uh, the Mental Health and Addiction Services. So I think that's sort of where it kind of started for me. Yeah. I recognized that the addiction and the mental health and that he was dealing with mental health issues um, that were sort of unrecognized. And then he tried to treat it um, with his own drug use. and. I think that was sort of like what sparked that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Based on your knowledge of, um, you know, with any work that you've done, um, this again, is just like, I'm curious, do you, I think a lot of times addiction is tied to underlying mental health conditions. Do you know anything about like statistics out there or, um, you know, cause it, cause sometimes I also think addiction happens just because, you know, at a young age, people like become experimental and then it, it just becomes like an addiction because of like the chemicals in their brain. And, um, and then it's just like a, you know, a, a cyclical thing that they can't get out of. Um, any insight on that? No statistics off the top of my head that I, I would, I would be, I would fear misquoting any statistic, but I, I would, it's such a deep complex issue. Yeah. Um, and the, even addiction now, there are so many different theories as to what causes addiction, who might be more susceptible to addiction. Is it because people are isolated? They don't have a sense of community. There are a series of studies um, around mice that when given the opportunity to either choose cocaine water or regular water when they're by themselves, they always choose the cocaine. But then when they're surrounded by a community of other mice, they never choose the cocaine water. So like there are, there are multiple studies out there and there are theories and, but I think addiction is still this very much, it's very difficult to understand because it's a very case by case basis. And I also, I watched this series, it's called Soft White Underbelly uh, done by a photographer called Mark Laida. Where and is, is it on Netflix or where? On YouTube and he just, he, so he lives in California by Skid Row um, in Los Angeles, and he interviews drug addicts. He interviews uh, people living on the street. He interviews all sorts of different people. And after having watched so many of those videos, they're heartbreaking. But sometimes it's as simple as I broke my leg and yeah. they gave me these pills. And I it made me feel so confident and happy in a way that I'd never felt in my life before that had not having them made me feel like I was living a less fulfilled life. And so like how people get into addiction, the reasons they get stuck into it are, are so varying. Yeah. And people they'll try drugs and not get addicted. It's, it's. Yeah, no, I hear you. And that makes complete sense. It's very complex, but I think oftentimes, um, we do or you hear that it is attributed to an underlying mental health condition but yeah for sure like with the opioid crisis i'm sure a lot of that is just from accessing drugs feeling a certain way and then continuing to go back to it i know um i used to suffer from extreme anxiety when i would give presentations and i had to give presentations a lot in my uh, prior workplace and um, a doctor had prescribed me Xanax, and, which is an anti-anxiety. 
And I mean, I took that thing and I was like, shit, this stuff is like really calms me down, you know? And so I became very aware that like, that is something that I need to be very careful with because it felt so good, you know? So, definitely, and it was definitely handed to me in a very like, without that caution of like, it's highly addictive and like, you know, all these things that you hear about more so now with anti-anxiety drugs in particular, but yeah, you know, this was like 10 years ago and it was kind of handed to me like a, take it when you need it, but like with no kind of yeah. other precautions, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and then like for me, I've also had struggles with addiction myself in my own life because every time you try to fill like that empty space because every time you have that empty space, you start thinking about things and you start having to deal with whatever it is that's going on with you, what's really going on with you. And so it's easier to just fill the gaps with something else to sort of, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Kind of kill the noise in that sense. And so I think definitely mental health. So one of our primary focuses in the organization are mental health, homelessness, and addiction. And I think that those three things quite often have a yeah. fairly relationship um and i think mental health if you're feeling if you're feeling some sort of way and i would say that like you know obviously people who need medication for whatever mental health um just sort of they have that's fantastic if that's something that helps you um but i think therapy is super helpful for people and it helps people talk things out and sort of figure things out in their own minds and i think that's so inaccessible um that people either are in SSRIs or they're self-medicating in some way with like drinking or smoking weed or other drugs. And so I think they're, they are very closely related. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you see it. I find, especially during uh, COVID, it seems like there's a lot of, a lot more people, um, at least I've seen it where I live. Uh, you know, you see a lot more homelessness lately. And uh, in my area, you see a lot of like the tents popping up, like people setting up tents. And then um, I live close to CAMH, uh, which is a Canadian uh, mental health or um, hospital. So you see a lot of a lot of people with mental health, you know, wandering around the streets. And um, because I'm, I'm much more informed, you know, like I'm able to just take it for what it is but you see people like kind of avoiding and going around and you know just like really irritated that that's even happening so um it's my heart it's yeah my heart so much yeah i think that in i think there's a lack of support and i think in some really terrible kind of way covid is sort of highlighting all of these problems that we have and that we've had for a very long time but it's pushing them to the forefront yeah um and i think with mental health, people fall through the cracks. People, it's just the way our society is structured and this idea that you have to have a job, you have to be able to pay your bills, you have to take care of yourself. But when you deal with a mental health disorder and you go through periods of time, albeit a couple of days, maybe a month at a time where you're switching medication or you're dealing with a depressive episode or psychosis, you can't maintain a regular everyday job and there needs to be those support systems to help people when they go through those things. Um, mm -hmm. But there aren't. And I think we're seeing a lot of that now manifesting yeah. people sleeping in tents or, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about like art and um, I did want to talk about a couple of the projects that you had working uh, that uh, you're specifically working on, but just out of curiosity, like how, has art, if at all, kind of helped you and your process and your journey of, you know, what you went through with bipolar, what you continue to go through with losing your brother, just with life and, and its difficulty? Like, have you turned to art um, for that kind of therapy? Yeah, absolutely. I think there are two ways that I love enjoying art. It's as a participant and then as a viewer. So as a participant, it, it slows you down. It sort of just forces you, it's almost meditative in a sense. Um, and it's less about what you produce as much as it is just about the process of producing in general. And it's funny because I've actually kind of lost art creation in my life since I started the organization because I've been so busy doing so many things that I haven't been making the space to create. But since COVID has happened, I have a little bit more space. I'm at home. There's no need to travel to meetings. So I started doing embroidery. I've started drawing. And it is 
unbelievable how beneficial that is just to my mental health, just to be able to create something. It doesn't even matter what it looks like, just to be able to create just, it sort of helps you work through some of the things that you're going through your own mind. It forces you to slow down and focus on one specific task. It forces you to be in the moment with whatever that thing is that you're creating. Um, and so it's very similar to meditation in that way. And then throughout my life as a participant, as a viewer, uh, art has been really beneficial because it's, it's almost this unspoken thing. Sometimes you see a piece of art. I have a friend who said she went to the MoMA and she saw Jackson Pollock and she just started crying. And not everybody's gonna have that reaction to that painting. Maybe nobody else has a reaction to that painting, but that's what makes art so unbelievably powerful is that different things resonate with different people. And prior to the written word and language and printed text, we communicated primarily through images. And so images have this really powerful connection to us. And I think the oldest cave painting is 64,000 years old. So the need to express yeah. and create and just make sense of the world around you has been around or has been a part of us for so long um, that it's almost instinctive and coming back to it almost feels for me instinctual. Like it makes sense that like, you know, every job that I've worked that I've felt unhappy at is because I had a lack of creativity. Um, and I think whether it's writing, maybe it's journaling, maybe it's playing the ukulele, maybe it's whatever creative thing that you can tap into, I think is going to make more space for you to get to know yourself um, and, I don't know, feel a sense of accomplishment at creating yeah. something or just producing something. Because I think yeah. a lot of what we do is we consume. So we like watch Netflix, well, reading books is great, but you know, you, you take in content versus producing output. Um, and I think producing output in whatever capacity that is, is really powerful. And for me, it's just always been art. Yeah. And I know that, you know, you'll talk about this a bit more in the series that, um, that you're going to be hosting over the next few weeks, but I guess there's the two sides of it that, that you talk about, like the, you know, using it as like a meditative process, um, but then also using it to tell a story about mental health as well and to express like what's going on inside. Sometimes you can't express it verbally, but by expressing that through a piece of art as well. And I imagine that you see that a lot in the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think one of the general misunderstandings about mental health is that it's not the same as physical health. So in the same way that I could show you an x-ray of a broken leg and you can understand that there's a pain and something broken there, I can't do the same with mental health. And so that was one of the driving motivations behind Life on the Line was how can we convey these deep, real emotions to people in a way that they might be able to understand it differently? And mm -hmm. so art is really powerful that. I think also the written word obviously is a really powerful, I think any creative expression is a really great way to express mental health because it's really difficult to share in any sort of logical kind of way other than yeah. just trying to use the tools that we have to do that, so. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because like I said, you know, I, I never studied art, I never really took art classes and stuff like my creative, I guess, outlet was more so in drama. I did, I studied drama throughout high school and stuff. But um, when I was going through, when I got diagnosed with OCD and kind of those first few months of, of going through quite intense um, therapy, um, on my downtime, I was spending a lot of time with my nieces uh, who are quite creative. And so I would just sit down with them and like, they love to draw and, and like paint and whatever. So I would do that with them. and just doing simple things like that for me was so like therapeutic or I would come up with crafts to do with them. Like it was around Christmas. So we bought like, you know, the brown paper and like did our own patterns and made Christmas paper. And um, it was Halloween before that. So like we did like these cool wax melting creations on the pumpkins. And yeah, it was like, I to this day believe that that time with my nieces and nephews doing simple uh, creative crafty kind of things is kind of what got me through a very tough time. And I think partly it's because it brought me into the moment of being present. And, and the one thing too with art, and I think you guys touched on that a little bit um, in the first uh, uh, episode that you did was that, you know, at a young age, sometimes like 
at least for me, I just didn't think I was good at art because like, I didn't know what the rules were. Like, I didn't really know. I thought there were rules. And then when I see my nieces now and they paint and they do all these like abstract, like I have a few here on my fridge, they do all these really beautiful abstract paintings and they pick really beautiful colors. And it ta taught me like, there are no rules. Like they're just like expressing themselves. So that was, that was a really interesting experience for me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we like lose that like inherent intuitive, like I like this color, I like this color. I'm just not even gonna think about it. I'm just gonna follow yeah. my creative intuition. We go, oh, I was taught in color theory that this color doesn't go with this color. And we get so stuck in our own minds. We get analytical about it. Yeah. We don't need to just do what feels good. And I think that's a big part of like creating is or art expression is that you learn to kind of trust what you feel versus what you think. And yeah. I think that's a big, a big shift. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just going into some of the projects and campaigns, I mean, you've touched on some of them. I know the one as it pertains to uh, raising more awareness around overdose is something that you're working on right now. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about it. Obviously it hasn't launched yet. So give us a little teaser of what, what's to come. Yeah, definitely. So Overdose Awareness Day is every year and it's August 31st. Um, and actually we, we, we wanted it to be a photography campaign. And so we were working with an artist who was one of the artists from Life in the Line the first time around. Um, and we were going to do a photography installation at Nathan Phillips Square. There were gonna be 36 photographs of shoes of people who had lost their lives to an overdose. Oh, wow. um, but as we started to get all the pieces together, everything started, you know, everything started sort of falling into place. We were looking for sponsorship. COVID happened. Yeah. Um, and so we realized, okay, this is still really impactful and important. We still want to do this, but I don't know that having something be in a public space where people's physical engagement with it, um, it the success relies on that is such a good idea. So we switched it to a digital campaign. So okay. it's essentially a digital photography exhibition, which is almost like a digital memorial where we put a call for submissions out for anybody who's lost a loved one to an overdose to submit a photograph of their shoes. The project is called Weathered. Um, and the photographer on the project, Jessica Okonski, the original concept sort of came from a visit to a museum in Auschwitz and seeing a huge pile of shoes of people who had lost their lives during the Holocaust was really impactful because it gave you a sense of First of all, the last moments that were spent possibly in those shoes, as well as the scale. And it really made her feel the sense of presence um, in yeah. a way that, that maybe like reading about it or, or seeing photographs of people just didn't. And so that's sort of where the concept came from. Um, and her and I kind of worked on the project. And, and instead of unfortunately her taking the photographs, which we hope that we're going to do next year. Do yeah. Them. I was going to say, will she still take the photographs, I guess? No. Yeah. Yeah. Next year. Like next year, yeah. But she also, we, we got two people um, who brought their shoes to her. Oh, okay. After the COVID restrictions, so she's taken a couple of photographs for them. Um, and and I guess this way you can open it up to a larger audience, like globally, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and so we've gotten a bunch of submissions of people's shoes who lost their lives to an overdose. And we're basically going to do a digital fundraising campaign specifically for the organization Street Health. They're based in Toronto and they have an overdose prevention site which lost government funding in March of 2019. And they've basically been surviving on individual donations for the past, I guess, year and three months now. And they're gonna run out of funding in March, 2021. And overdose prevention sites have been proven time and time again statistically to reduce overdose death um, and are a major benefit to the societies in which they function and specifically where street health is at Dundas and Sherborne, it's a really high need area. Um, and so we're basically yeah. doing a digital memorial where we're driving all the traffic to street health overdose prevention site to try and raise some money for them so they can continue providing those services. That's amazing. And um, sorry, I know you said the date, but when is that August? Yeah, so we're going to be doing the campaign throughout August, um, yeah. but August 31st is Overdose Awareness Day, um, and throughout that we're going to be sharing, of course, all the photographs that people have submitted, as well as their stories. We have a couple of videos um, of people sharing about the people that they've lost, and those are heartbreaking to go yeah. to, but really yeah. important stories to be told. And we're also going to have space at the screens at Young and Dundas. 
um, exhibiting photos of the shoes themselves. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, and I think like just as you were explaining like the shoe concept, it like gave me goosebumps because I think, yeah, there is something really quite touching about that and really makes you reflect on, you know, that individual being, you know, on earth for the last, you know, moments of their life. Yeah, um, and it's well, when yeah. someone comes over to your house and their shoes are at the front door, or it's like if you live with somebody and you see their shoes are there, you're like their home, you know, there's this like, yeah, uh, just emotional resonance the shoes have, I think. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. I look forward to seeing that. And definitely, I know that you've posted, uh, like done a, a call for submissions, but if you, when you do that again, we'll definitely share to our audience as well. Um, and see if anyone is, uh, is out there that would like to participate. Awesome. So um, how, I mean, you, so you've been around, I guess, since uh, with 2020 Arts since 2018. Um, and like you said, it kind of grew, you know, like it kind of took off relatively quickly with um, the campaign that you did with the subway campaign. I can't remember the name of it right now. Mm -hmm. um, how has the community responded in general to, to what you've been doing? I see that obviously you're really connected to a lot of the artists all around and we're gonna be meeting some of them in the next few weeks. Um, but yeah, just generally, you know, like I know that in, here in Toronto, we have Workman's Art um, and uh, yeah, interested to learn uh, more about how the community's responded overwhelmingly in a really positive way. So the first time we did the campaign, I had no experience doing a public art project whatsoever, but I just emailed a couple of publications. And so we got published in like the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, uh, CBC, all of these different places. And we had a launch event for Life on the Land the first time. And through that visibility, we had people buy original artworks, uh, where 50% of those proceeds were donated to the Canadian Mental Health Association. Um, and it's been extremely positive. I've had people reaching out to me, um, even after, even recently, who have seen these articles online about the campaign uh, with a really positive response. Um, I think it might be a little bit biased in some sense, in that like most of the people who support me are my loved ones and family and friends and they all are very supportive of what I do um, but I think overall and I'm finding specifically with this project with Weathered that the there is an unbelievable need in some ways for for somebody to create some sort of visual visibility around these issues yeah. and I think for a very long time I've always I've loved art from such a young age and I just feel like the connection between being able to do something good with your art and like the connection between the artist who wants to do good and then the actual infrastructure to be able to translate that into donations or to, into a fundraiser is just not there. Um, and so from all of the artists that I've ever worked with, they're so generous. Artists are the most generous people I've, I've ever met. Um, and they all want to be able to give back in some way. And I think there are not so many opportunities for them to do so. So I really hope to be able to kind of fill that space and allow people to give back to causes that they feel passionate about. Yeah. And yeah. yeah and I think that our, you know, Made of Millions and 2020 Arts is similar in, in another sense of, you know, really changing the look of what mental health has been perceived up to this point, you know, like as being very clinical in nature, very scary very um, just stigma out of control. And so I think, um, you know, your brand is really cool and um, just being able to, to use tools like art to be able to tell the story in a different way than what we've been hearing up until this point and allow people that are suffering to be able to relate, whether it's through art or through storytelling or through a video or through something like this, seeing to, to people like us that, um, you know, are doing okay, I think, <laughs> and, uh, you know, have our own challenges. And I think it goes a long way. So um, I know at least I was drawn to, you know, just the look and feel of your brand and then the content on top of that. And I think that we've been missing that in society up until now. So I think there's a lot of um, similarities in, in, in what we're doing. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like it's such a big task. 
that having and working with another organization that's really trying to do the same thing. I think no one organization is going yeah. to reduce mental health stigma. And so it's just if we all just put in all of our effort and we're all vulnerable, open to sharing our stories, um, it'll slowly eventually chip away at that stigma and hopefully create changes in policy and make mental health services much more accessible for people so yeah and just get to a point where it can be prevented right and like early intervention is is key and um like you said we we weren't educated in the school system so you know finding a way to reach people that at a young age can become a bit more educated so that they know what you know what an intrusive thought is or they know that their emotions are okay and if they just sit with that feeling then it will eventually pass and you know to learn some meditation skills and stuff like that so um but i agree you know we're all about collaborating with other not-for-profits and mental health organizations and just kind of coming together and like seeing what we can do um so we're coming up close to the hour um if we do have any questions, uh, I don't know if you can see the questions on your side. Can you see them? I cannot. Okay, so uh, we just have one question. Are you familiar? I don't know what that means. <laughs> like the material, like the like resin as like a, so the answer is no. Yeah, maybe David Katz, you can clarify that. Um, but uh, while we're waiting to see if there's other questions, uh, how about you tell us a little bit about what we can expect uh, next week. So we um, have collaborated with 2020 Arts uh, for those that are, are watching on this new series. Um, and next week, Megan will be uh, hosting and introducing her first guest. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what to expect next week? I don't know how to get rid of this question. <laughs> um, so the, the first one that I did, I interviewed three artists all at the same time. And so I'm really excited to be able to interview one person at a time, sort of like this. You can really get into topics a little bit deeper, get into the artistic practice. So there are three artists that I'll be interviewing over the next three weeks. And the first one is Afanaki Temateo. And she is actually an artist member at Workman Arts, which you mentioned previously in our conversation. Um, and she's been a big mental health advocate, very open about talking about self-care um, and the practice of using art as a tool for art therapy. Um, so I'm intrigued to learn. I don't know. I don't know a ton about her more than what I've read through through biographies and through articles and interviews. And um, so I'm excited to kind of dive into that. And then the, the week after is an interview with Fong Nguyen, and she's an art therapist and also a practicing artist. So it'll be interesting to see that perspective as well from somebody mm -hmm. who's licensed um, to see how she's kind of on both sides of the fence as somebody who's helping and facilitating, but also somebody who benefits deeply from that. Um, and then on the third week, it's gonna be Shanina Diana, and she's a practicing artist, but she also runs workshops um, to reduce mental health stigma and through her work she does that and she does a lot of advocacy and I'm really excited to speak with her as well. All women, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> By accident, but yeah. Well you had one or two two guys on the first one. Or I think just yeah. one. Yeah. Mostly women totally by accident. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well <laughs> just means we'll have to do more in the future. Um yeah. just one last question for you before we wrap up. Um Obviously, with COVID, uh, this kind of just came to mind, but there are certain, um, I guess, communities or certain industries that are, are suffering more with work and things like that. And I know, at least I understand that the artist community is one of those that's um, and creative community at large. Uh, that's, you know, whether it's because it's more of like the event kind of side of things or the art gallery side of things or whatnot. Um, any any words of advice or insight when it comes to artists right now that are having a particularly tough time due to the circumstances? Have you come across that at all? I'm putting you on the spot, but just some. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I mean, I think, 
I think with every, I mean, it's depending what industry you're in or sort of what you rely on as an artist. I know that obviously the gallery structure is very deeply set. It's something that we've, we've relied on for a very long time, but it also involves physical engagement. It involves openings and events. Um, but even if you look at what the Toronto Outdoor Art Festival has done, Outdoor Art Fair has done, uh, they moved everything online. So now they're basically doing things through Instagram. They're providing artist features. So instead of going to a physical event where you can buy art, um, they have these curated collections by important curators. Uh, one of our board members did a curated collection on there. And so for art organizations, I think it's just as important for artists to pivot, try to find yeah. some way to build that online community um, and to be able to connect with like-minded individuals and to sort of think about what can I do that's slightly different maybe. There are a lot of uh, cool apps like virtual exhibition apps that are now coming out where you can sort of scroll through in the same way that you can with Google Arts and Museums. Uh, you kind of just walk through a gallery space, you can click on a piece, it'll give you a blurb about a piece. And so there are some interesting ways to continue to exhibition. I heard of a, this might be totally unrelated, but I heard of a nightclub. They're basically creating like a maze of sorts with like walls. So you can't oh, really? still, but you like walk through it as okay. a, like an experience to try and make yeah. it deeper. So, and I know some, I've seen, I follow one artist who's in LA and she's done some like, she's offered it free for her community. But I think, you know, there are opportunities to offer like, um, you know, art classes or, you know, some fun kind of Instagram live sessions with people because, yeah. you know, people like me who have like this, you know, like dormant creative side that hasn't been woken up would love to do something like that. So I think especially with people at home, they're much more open to um, finding ways to be creative and to kind of turn to artists that may have a bit more time now. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, it's just like all of us, I think in all industries are having to be a bit more creative with, um, you know, pivoting and kind of shifting based on what's going on. I went to the, um, Van Gogh uh, oh, yeah. exhibit um, last was week. That? It was really, really, really cool. I mean, uh, in addition to the art, it was also they uh, had music curated alongside. So the, with the music and the visual, it was just really powerful. And they actually have two options where you can do a walk through the exhibit or, and they had like the social distancing circles or you could do a drive through. Um, so for people that, you know, I saw a lot of people that were older in cars, like that didn't want to expose themselves. Um, and so they had like the two separate rooms to be able to do that, which was really cool. And I think just a beautiful experience, especially after being kind of indoors for so long. So yeah, we are starting to see some, some things changing, which is good. Yeah, I think it's important not to give up and just to think, what can we do differently? How can we build an infrastructure just in case uh, this happens yeah. again? We'll have something to like lean on. We still have these communities online. Yeah. Is that your uh, piece of art in the back there? No, this is actually, I don't know what you can see. This is by Egon Chile. Um, oh, okay. I've heard this yeah. had forever, but I don't know if you can see. That one's by me. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I see it. Wow. And that's a piece by Natalie Veryby, who was um, on the interview that I did oh, last week. Yeah, the first one. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, I, I enjoyed chatting with you. And like I said, you know, we've kind of been collaborating, but I didn't know too much about, you know, your own story and inspiration. So it was really great to learn that and inspiring. And I think, you know, for anyone out there that wants to get into the advocacy space, uh, mental health advocacy, I'm sure Megan and myself are both uh, open to, to chat. Um, or I can't volunteer you, but are you? Always, <laughs> are you? always. always. Yeah. yeah. Um, and tune in next week. Uh, Megan will be here uh, with her first guest. Um, and for those that, you know, if the time doesn't work next week, they are all going to be on demand. So you can either find them at madeofmillions.com or on our YouTube uh, site, madeofmillions.com. And I'm sure Megan will be posting um some clips as well in the future on some of the some of the interviews as well so yeah thank you so much Everybody well enjoy your weekend and um yeah stay cool actually we can probably stay on for a second after i after i log out but thank you everyone thank for joining yeah. and uh we'll see you next time next week.